Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast, your free radiology podcast for on-the-go board review. On this episode, I will be discussing cardiac masses for ABR board preparation. I will make a free downloadable study guide available on this topic that you can download at theradiologyreview.com. This episode will again be presented in a question and answer format. And without further ado, let's get into this episode. First question. For cardiac masses, are primary tumors or metastases more common? One more time. For cardiac masses, are primary tumors of the heart or metastases to the heart more common? The answer is that cardiac metastases are way more common than primary cardiac tumors, Cardiac metastases are something like 30 times more common than primary cardiac tumors. Keep that in mind. Next question. What malignancies are most likely to metastasize to the heart? The answer is that lung cancer makes up the number one malignancy that metastasizes to the heart, and number two is lymphoma. Next question. What is the top benign primary cardiac tumor in an adult? The most common benign primary cardiac tumor in an adult is a myxoma. That is M-Y-X-O-M-A, myxoma. Myxomas are more common in women, and complications of a cardiac myxoma include something like stroke or pulmonary embolism, And myxomas may also cause obstructive symptoms in the heart. As an aside, a cardiac lipoma is the second most common benign cardiac tumor in an adult. Next question. What is the most common location in the heart for a cardiac myxoma? You should know that cardiac myxomas are located in the left atrium approximately 75% of the time. And in the left atrium, cardiac myxomas are typically attached to the fossa ovalis. On the other hand, cardiac lipomas, which are the second most common benign cardiac mass, are common in both the right atrium and the left atrium. Whereas for a cardiac myxoma, these are much more common to be seen in the left atrium, And I would expect on board exam questions that myxomas would be presented to you as a left atrial mass in most cases. Next question. What is the Carney complex? Now, knowing things like the Carney complex can help you get board exam questions right if you can keep in mind the common associations with things like the Carney complex. The challenge with NNDs like this is simply recalling, based on the name Carney complex, what those associations are. So, what is the Carney complex? The Carney complex is an autosomal dominant disease process that is associated with myxomas, and the myxomas are most commonly cardiac. But myxomas can also be seen elsewhere in the Carney complex, including places like breast and testicular myxomas. And with the Carney complex, you also see skin hyperpigmentation, which have been termed blue nevi, N-E-V-I, which are most commonly on the face and trunk areas. Carney complex also has association with schwannomas and pituitary adenomas and several other things. Now, an absolute key for the ABR core exam is that two-thirds of patients with Carney complex will develop a cardiac myxoma or cardiac myxomas, and with Carney complex, it would not be unusual to have bilateral cardiac myxomas. 
So to review one more time, carny complex, autosomal dominant, primary feature is myxomas, most commonly in the heart, but also other places to include the breast and testes. You also have skin hyperpigmentation and some other tumors such as schwannomas and pituitary adenomas. That leads us to the next question. What is the difference between the carny complex and the carny triad? So this gets really tricky when you have entities like this that are so closely named to one another. So what is carny complex versus the carny triad? And bonus points to you if you get this correct. I would remember that the carny complex is cardiac related and there are three C's there, carny complex and cardiac. So if you have carny complex with that double C, that can help you remember that this is the one that has cardiac related myxomas. Carny triad, on the other hand, is a triad that includes extra adrenal paraganglioma, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and pulmonary chondroma. A key learning point for now is that carny complex is the one with the cardiac myxoma. Use those double C's in cardiac complex to remind you about the cardiac myxoma association. On the other hand, carny triad simply needs to be memorized as extra adrenal paraganglioma, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and pulmonary chondroma. Next question. What is the top malignant primary cardiac tumor in an adult? I do think it is high yield to memorize what is most common in terms of benign versus malignant cardiac tumors and also adult versus child cardiac tumors. And it is also important to know the most common tumors in adults and children and pay attention to these as you study for the ABR core exam. What is the top malignant primary cardiac tumor in an adult? The number one malignant primary cardiac tumor in an adult is a cardiac angiosarcoma. And these are most common in adults approximately 20 to 50 years of age. So one more time, cardiac angiosarcoma is the top malignant primary cardiac tumor in an adult. Follow-up question to this, what is the most common location for a cardiac angiosarcoma? The answer is that cardiac angiosarcomas are most common in the right atrial wall. Now with an angiosarcoma, these typically look as invasive masses that arise from the actual wall of the cardiac chambers. Unlike a lipoma or myxoma that is more commonly seen as a more benign appearing mass predominantly within the right atrial lumen, a bad sign for malignancy in the heart is if you have an associated malignant pericardial effusion. So if you see a right atrial mass that looks aggressive involving the wall and you have a pericardial effusion, cardiac angiosarcoma should be high on your differential. Entities such as myxomas and lipomas tend not to have an associated pericardial effusion unless there are two separate processes occurring, but I think they probably wouldn't confuse you like that on an ABR test question. Next, what is the top benign cardiac tumor in young children? The answer is that a rhabdomyoma is the top benign cardiac tumor in young children. Cardiac rhabdomyomas are usually detected really early in life, and these are typically detected even at less than one year of age. A malignant rhabdomyosarcoma becomes more common in older children and young adults. So if you see a cardiac mass in a baby less than one year of age, statistically this is most common to be a rhabdomyoma. Malignant rhabdomyosarcomas become more common in older childhood and young adults. Next question. Cardiac rhabdomyomas are strongly associated with what multisystemic disease? 
The answer here is tuberous sclerosis. About 50% of cardiac rhabdomyomas are seen in the setting of tuberous sclerosis. On board exams, if they show you a head CT or a brain MRI in a child, along with a cardiac scan showing a mass, tuberous sclerosis should be high on your differential from the get-go. Note also that cardiac fibromas also have a tuberous sclerosis association, but the strongest association is between cardiac rhabdomyomas and tuberous sclerosis. Next question. Is cardiac lymphoma most commonly primary or secondary? The answer is that cardiac lymphoma is most commonly secondary and most commonly from a non-Hodgkin lymphoma and very common in the clinical setting of HIV infection. Cardiac lymphoma often presents with a large malignant pericardial effusion. Next, how does lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum present on an FDG PET-CT scan? With lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum, you would expect to see increased FDG uptake in the interatrial septal region that corresponds with interatrial fat on CT. Now, lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum is technically not a lipoma, as a lipoma is an encapsulated mass, and lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum is simply non-encapsulated fat that is located within the interatrial septum. This is benign but can be associated with arrhythmias as is also the case with cardiac lipomas. Next question. What is the most common primary cardiac tumor of the cardiac valves? The answer is that a papillary fibroelastoma is the most common primary tumor of the cardiac valves. Primary fibroelastomas most commonly involve the aortic valve, followed by the mitral valve, followed by the tricuspid valve, and least common in the pulmonary valve. So to recap, the most common primary cardiac tumor that involves the cardiac valves is the papillary fibroelastoma, and this would be most common in the aortic valve, followed by the mitral valve. Papillary fibroelastomas are benign primary cardiac tumors. On cardiac MRI, these are typically seen as a fairly small, well-defined pedunculated mass that is associated with a cardiac valve, and the treatment for this entity is surgical resection. Next question. If you see a cardiac mass and you are presented with clinical symptoms of flushing and headache, what entity should you consider? The answer here is that a cardiac paraganglioma can present with clinical symptoms of flushing and headache or other endocrine-associated symptoms. Cardiac paragangliomas are endocrine active lesions that may be associated with elevated chromogranin A levels and elevated mendenephrine levels in the plasma and urine. And I simply think you should be aware that cardiac paragangliomas exist. Lastly, for this episode, I just want to mention a few additional cardiac tumors that I think you should simply be aware of. The first is a pericardial teratoma, which, like other teratomas, would have components from all three germ cell layers. Pericardial teratomas are most common in infants, and they may have a large associated pericardial effusion. The other cardiac mass I think you should simply be aware of as a possibility is a cardiac osteosarcoma. Now this entity does not make sense to me because there is no bone in the heart. Nonetheless, you can develop a primary cardiac osteosarcoma, and these are nearly always in the left atrium, and they may have direct invasion into the pulmonary veins. If you see an osteoid matrix or highly calcified mass lesion of the left atrium, you should consider the possibility that this is a primary cardiac osteosarcoma. And with all sarcomas of the heart, the risk for metastatic disease is high. 
that concludes the questions I have on cardiac masses, at least for now. Some of you may be aware that on Twitter, I recently released a poll asking our threes and our fours how prepared they currently feel for the ABR core exam in 2021. I had about 30 residents respond to this question. The results of this survey showed that there are no R4s that currently feel on track with their study for the ABR core exam, and there was one R3 who stated that he or she is on track with their board preparation study. What that means is that about 96% of you feel that you are currently behind on your ABR core examination study. I have a few thoughts on this. First of all, you are probably better off than you suspect. While I am overall surprised that we didn't have at least a few more of you saying that you are currently on track with your ABR core exam preparation, I think it would be typical for every year of test takers to generally feel behind for their board preparation. With the ABR core exam, it is important to take this exam seriously and study hard. Nonetheless, the large majority of you truly will pass this examination, and I suspect that at least 50% of you, if not more, are actually on track with your board study, even though it may not feel that way for you. Now, other than your radiology residency training, in my opinion, passing the ABR core exam does require a significant amount of self-study. Give yourself a pat on the back for listening to this podcast because that is something that is not required of you to do. But I believe some of the topics I discuss may help you to prepare for the ABR core examination. Also, simply keep up the study at home. Set certain study goals for the near-term and the longer-term study plan and make sure that you are achieving those. Finally, take heart that basically everybody feels unprepared at this stage and continue your preparation by studying in a consistent manner. Focus on those areas that you feel most weak in. And remember that consistent effort over time will give you fantastic results in terms of ABR core exam preparation, as well as preparation to become excellent radiologists. Prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.